Thank you so much. I've seen some more folks hop online to join us. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone again for joining our Republican Lieutenant Governor Primary Candidate Forum tonight, hosted by the ARC of Northern Virginia, the Autism Society of Northern Virginia, Virginia Board for People with Disabilities, Training and Alumni Associations, and a number of other partners who've worked so hard with us to get the word out for this event. So we'll keep our questions going. And this time we'll start with Mr. Alawalia, and we would love to pose a question to you about education. So inclusion of students with disabilities in all facets of life is incredibly important. And for many people that starts in education. And we see yes. students who are in inclusive education services with students without disabilities have far greater abilities and opportunities open to them later in life. But we're having a challenge right now where when students with disabilities have complex needs, that their public school is having trouble meeting, in order to get additional supports, that student must leave the public school and must go to a private school setting to get additional options. Um, there was a bill that failed in the 2021 General Assembly that looked at saying, why don't we give students and families that choice? And if they would like to bring those extra resources, maybe that one-to-one -one aid or extra therapy into their base school, to both keep that student in their home and community and ideally build capacity at a lower dollar amount at their public school, we would love to see that do, be done. And um, it didn't happen this year, but we would love your thoughts on where we go with education, especially inclusive education for folks with disabilities. Well, first thing is that I have been uh, hard on uh, Secretary Kearney in asking for his resignation for first is imposing critical race theory on our kids. So it's important that what we teach our kids is um, a, a, a true history of the United States and a less divisive and hateful uh, history of our, of our great nation. At the same time, especially with kids, I also wanna make sure that they should have all the options available, especially with the parents or their guardians to be able to get any kind of support they need because ultimately what is our goal is to have our community and our society productive and feel that they're giving back into the society. So what it does is that when we have education, which is tailor-made to kids, which is basically knowing with an aptitude test that what their strength and what their weaknesses are, then we are able to propel these kids. And I know for a fact, because I have my own child, which had, has got disabilities because she was born with a heart defect. And for her, learning comes a little slowly, but she has to work twice or three times as hard. So what is important for us that certain subjects, be it maths or be it um, history, it's hard for them to really remember those or work, uh, work towards achieving those. But at the same time, the perseverance of these kids is tenacious. They're very strong kids. God has made them resilient and I call them miracle babies. So what's important for us is to make sure that we have an aptitude test so that we can help to guide the child. We are a country of technology. We lead in all spheres of that. If we can have these kids with aptitude tests and we know their strength and their weaknesses are, then we can help to guide them. At the same time, some kids are late bloomers. So what can happen is that sometime in the second grade or the third grade or the fourth grade, these kids are, are, are looking to find what their niche is, what God-given gift they have. And again, I leave it to the parents or the guardian to be the best choice for them, be it homeschooling, be it a charter school, or be it a special school of needs where these kids can have vocational trainings, or if they want to go into the field of IT, or even if they just want to go into a simple field of whatever the, the gift or talent they have. So it's important that we can work towards that. And most importantly, use the new technology of the Zoom training and education that's available now we have enough intellectual pool or the talent pool to teach these kids and we can have smaller classes where personalized training and personalized focus can be given to these kids so they can really blossom very effectively and very successfully. So it, it's the, the focus of the leadership to really get down in details and find solutions. At this point, it's just one blanket lean of one blanket approach to all issues, which doesn't makes sense because all kids have different weaknesses and different strengths. So let's build on their strengths and let's propel them in what they feel is most important. And there could be aptitude tests or, or, or various talent tests that can be done to propel these kids. And who better than parents who know that what's good for their kids and the children are themselves very smart to find their niche and move in that direction. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll turn things over now to Mr. Allen to also talk with us about inclusive education and how we make sure students with disabilities are well served. 
Yeah, so I, I love this question because I think that this is a question that stands beyond people uh, with disabilities. I am a huge promoter of school choice. Um, I call it parental choice because I believe that no one's going to fight harder for your family than you are. That's a core belief that I've had uh, always. And I think, number one, I think promoting school choice or parental choice, what it, what it does is, I mean, just for everyone, it, it allows us to promote schools with good models, right? Instead of funding failing institutions or failing administrations, we end up sending our money and our children to places that excel and that model can be copied over. And I like that, especially for this conversation, because when you think about it, a private school focused on individuals with disabilities does a lot of things, right? Number one, it focuses on your disability and helping you and how you translate that into society, which is something that you won't get inside the public education system because they're just not equipped to do it. And oh, by the way, when you try to copy that across every, every school in the public education system, it just doesn't work, right? They're, they're not equipped to it, they neglect it, or it accounts for less than 5% or even 1% in some cases of their actually student, student population. So they want that money to go somewhere else. So imagine a world where you live and thrive in a school that's specifically built around your needs. I mean, it sounds wonderful. The second thing that it does is it helps you make, it helps you not feel different, right? Um, and I think that that's something that all of our children want. They want to be around people that make them feel included. They want to be around people who understand what they're going through. And so I love the private school, charter school, homeschool, you name it, school option, because what it does is it allows the parent, the family, the child to have a choice and a voice in the education that they get. And so I, I absolutely think that we could do a better job of it. I think we've got Republicans in our own field um, who have voted against school choice. And what I like to say to people is, and I think this is the perfect place to say it, is this isn't a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. This isn't a people with disabilities or a people without disabilities issue. This is an everybody issue. And I think that we should all get behind this effort. I think that we could do a better job in Virginia. Um, the last note I'll say on it is the public education system alone in Virginia is broken. We rank 49 out of 51 in the entire nation. We pay our teachers less than everyone else. We have some of the worst quality curriculum coming out of our public education system. And lastly, I would just say that just under half of every tax dollar you send to the public education system goes to education. No, it goes to funding some failing institution or some failing administration somewhere. My wife's a teacher. My mom was a teacher. Her mom was a teacher. My wife took a job as a kindergarten teacher was fired from that job. Well, not fired. She was moved from that job about two weeks into it because they wanted to hire another principal. How many principals did they have at this K through five school? They had four. Explain to me why you need four principals. So I think that taking that money away and giving that voice and that power back to the families uh, does a much better job of supporting the education needs of our children uh, than the government ever could. Thank you. Thank you. And Delegate Davis, we'll turn it over to you for your thoughts on inclusive education for students with disabilities. Sure. So I think my colleagues may have not caught the inclusive part on this. I mean, I, I'm a big supporter of homeschool and charter schools, and there's definitely a place here, but the homeschool piece kind of doesn't get to the inclusion piece. And I think we're talking about kind of about the CSA funds and and kind of what's happened and the solution, honestly, that y'all brought to the table this year uh, that did not go as it should have. And the, the question is, you know, what, you know, how do we turn the trend around? I think a lot of it has to do with education of my colleagues. It, we, it ultimately requires 51% of those in the House of Delegates and the Senate to, to move forward and, and to, you know, fix these types of challenges. And I think this is something that is a little complicated for them. Um, it's a very unique situation that many in the, in the education committee we may be aware of, but once you get outside the education committee, not that many have uh, truly understand this. I think the meetings that happen in the off session uh, um, amongst uh, ARCA Virginia and, and other entities uh, that advocate for those with disabilities have tremendous impact. But I'll say that more so than anything is individual families and individuals coming up and actually sharing their stories and and what this means to them and, and how it impacts them. You know, as legislators, we can all read a book and, and we can all see the numbers, but ultimately it's, it's individuals coming and sharing what that inclusion piece is so important and, and the challenge they have when they have to, 
you know, go through the transport, you know, out of uh, out of their local, you know, uh, school districts or or what happens when they end up in some cases, like y'all mentioned, where they end up having to literally move out of the area. Um, so we need to grow capacity inside of our local schools. So that is something that I think is very important. as part of the solution and that's in making sure that our schools have the resources um, to best allow our children and students to reach their full potential and in some cases to ensure that happens you have to bring in competition and I'll go back to the Julie Billiard school that you know uh, they have out in Ohio and and how much I learned out there you know I didn't understand sensory swings before I went out there I didn't realize, you know, that that when someone has a challenge in spelling, uh, you know, that's on the spectrum, sometimes just being on that sensory swing kind of helps. Or that mini trampoline when it comes to those with math challenges, it's it's interesting just certain small resources and how that helps certain individuals. And sometimes you need to bring schools into the area that provide those additional resources. And when our public schools see individuals leave, to go to these schools, the public schools then raise their own bar and provide those resources as well. I think in Virginia Beach, we've done a good job uh, in an inclusion scenario in our public schools um, to provide resources to help those with disabilities. But I would also argue that in other areas of Virginia, that they have not reached that same bar. And even in Virginia Beach, there's still more that needs to be done to provide those additional resources. Um, so I think it comes with advocacy from the community, but I do think allowing um, that competition from school choice to come in and have these entities come in that provide those additional resources would also, we, would also cause our public schools to elevate that bar as well and provide those resources inside of a uh, inclusionary environment. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll start off with Mr. Allen um, as our next first answer of the question. And this is one that someone had sent in to us in advance. And I thought it was a great question. And it was essentially, how will you make sure that you keep hearing from people with disabilities and young people and all kinds of diverse communities that may not necessarily be well represented uh, in the hiring stream of Richmond? So how do we make sure that those voices that you're hearing from tonight are still elevated and a part of the work that you do if you are elected. And they suggested a task force, but we would love any thoughts at all that you have on how you would like to do that. Right. So um, number one, uh, I I have heard, uh, you know, you don't understand things unless you're on the committee. You don't understand things unless you're behind the door. I think in my first uh, Republican committee meeting, what I heard was um, you couldn't possibly understand the legislation coming out of Richmond. And I that's when I knew I wanted to run for politics. Look, I think everyone deserves a voice. I picked the office of lieutenant governor for a very specific reason, and I think it dovetails nicely into the question. So if you don't mind, I'll kind of roll with that and I'll and then I'll get into the question. Um, there was an example that I like to use of why I picked the office for lieutenant governor. Uh, there was gun legislation, gun reform legislation, which doesn't have anything to do with this conversation, but it was coming out in 2019 and legislators held these town halls um, on the Monday after the holidays during business hours, only, you know, like 200 people could attend, only 20 people could speak, you could only speak for two minutes, you had to pre-register to attend, you had to pre-pre-register to speak. I'm trying to talk a little slower because I don't want to mess your uh, interpreter up. I talk a little fast sometimes. Um, but I just thought, what a slap in the face to representative government. And I thought if there was one person in Virginia government who could call BS, right, who could go out and talk to communities, you sit perfectly between the legislature legislature, the executive, and you're a part-time citizen legislator. Who, who better, honestly, in the state of Virginia to go out and talk to these communities? And I think you're right. I think a task force or whatever, whatever moniker you would like to call it specifically focused on those with disabilities and those needs would be absolutely perfect. I think we should have more of those town halls. I tell people all the time, there are 95 counties in Virginia, and it's ridiculous that we have a governor who never visited Culpeper County before, and he's lived here his entire life. 
So I think we have to do a better job of getting out of Richmond and going to talk to people with those needs. Uh, and then I would just say, I also think that we have to do a better job of advocating for those needs uh, back in Richmond so that you feel like you have a voice because you do. And it's so important that we give that voice to you and not make it feel stifled. Um, yeah. And I think the Lieutenant Governor, I mean, no matter who wins the nomination, no matter who wins who wins the office of Lieutenant Governor, the message I would like to send is, I think we should start looking at the office of Lieutenant Governor for what it can be and should be, not what we've let it become, right? When's the last time you saw Lieutenant Governor do anything besides defend himself from sexual harassment or sexual assault allegations? So I think we've all got a better job to do, Republican and Democrat, of giving you the people a voice back in your capital. Thank you. And I think I might have to drop off. I'm speaking next, but I'll try to join back as soon as I get done. Okay, we're, we're a flexible crowd. <laughs> uh, all right, so Delegate Davis, we're back over to you um, with your chance to let us know how you would make sure that we've got diverse voices included if you're elected and you're hearing from folks who are um, impacted by your choices. Sure, sure. So for me, it's, it's what I've always been doing whether I was um, you know, on city council or a candidate or in the House of Delegates. And that's making sure that it's a two-way conversation. First off, if, if y'all aren't reaching out to me, I'll be reaching out to you. But I will tell you that, uh, that your community and the advocates inside the community are extremely good at reaching out. Um, and every year I'm thrilled to you know, sit down and have the conversations. I know last year was a little difficult because of COVID. So they had to be done across Zoom. Um, but to, to be able to have both the advocates um, there sharing the needs and the challenges and what we can do as legislators to help, more importantly, um, to actually have individuals uh, with the disabilities share with us their challenges and what they think uh, we can do uh, to help. Uh, it's, uh, we did it across Zoom this last time, but you know, in the future, I, I look forward to getting everyone back together again in person. And I think that's the most important thing. I, I do like the idea of a task force. I, I think that um, at the governor's level, there is that commission. But to tell you the truth, I like, I like to have those conversations personally myself. Um, you know, I, I don't like the grapevine scenario. Um, you know, when someone is telling me and relaying someone else's story, the passion isn't there sometimes as much. The personal nature, only someone that is going through a set of challenges. Only a parent of a child can express, you know, the challenges that they're facing. So I've always believed that it's very important for a legislator to have those conversations directly um, and, uh, and to get an understanding of the challenges faced and then share what we think may be solutions with the community before we move forward with them. Uh, too often legislators, uh, either hear of a problem or think there's a problem. Uh, we try to solve it with all good intentions, but without having the people that actually are in that life day in and day out, uh, you know, give us their opinion. A lot of times, um, uh, you know, it, it's not exactly the most ideal outcome we come up with. So I think that it's very important uh, for that type of two-way communication. Um, email is wonderful. I, I know all offices are different, my office is uh, understands that every email comes in. I want to see it uh, personally, so I have an understanding, regardless of the community it comes from. Uh, and then they also understand that when it comes to having um, meetings with constituents and with communities, that it's not just I, I, my staff can be in the meeting, but I want to be in that meeting uh, because I want to have a firm understanding of the challenges and how we can help solve people's you know, problems. And so I think that's the best, uh, the best way for elected officials to do it. Thank you so much. And so we will give um, Puneet Alawalia a chance here and please jump in and let us know how you're going to make sure you're hearing from the disability community and other communities that may not otherwise have the ear of the Lieutenant Governor. Well, first thing is thank you. Very important question. The reason why I decided to run because I, as President Trump said very rightfully, if they had done the job, then people like me and others would not be running. I'm a father with three kids, with businesses. I know the challenges. I saw the direction our state was going in. I saw the law and order situation. I saw the business situation. I saw the education system. And folks with disability is a very important integral part of our society. We got to take care of them. And there are many others we have to take care of. And that's the reason I'm a grassroots leader. I would like to make sure that we have these roundtables 
uh, and open town halls. You see, we have 11 districts in our state. There's no reason why once a month, Lieutenant Governor can sit down and have these open dialogues with folks. And it's an open forum because I believe when you sit down in person and talk to the community and I would request our, our county chairs, our district chairs, lead this effort so that we can expand the party, we can expand the issues, we can take care of the solutions. That's the reason why we are hired in the first place by the people of Virginia. And that's so important. At the same time, I've been going around the state, uh, giving my business card with phone numbers on it. Folks, I'm gonna be your representative. My goal is to make sure that your issues, in fact, I am the mouthpiece of your issues and your concerns. That's what I've been doing. None of these issues which is there, oh, this is, is a hot issue, so let's work on that. No, I saw the Second Amendment right being taken away from us because I know what happens to law-abiding citizens and minorities when this happened. At the same time, when you increase the minimum wage or you loot and riot and find a way to justify that, that's the reason I ran for, I'm running for office. And that same thing is if your family needs your elected official to give you the necessary attention and take care of the issues that it is, we should be there for you. And what we need to do is have enough ways. For some reason, if I cannot respond to you at 3 a.m. in the morning, there should be a way that we do get back to you next day in the morning or next day in the afternoon at the latest, because it's so important. And at the same time, I strongly believe town halls and organizations such as yours to be the mouthpiece of the people. Because that's so important, because if you want to, to really hold us accountable and, and have a transparent leadership, it's important that you hold us accountable and say, why are you not responding to me? Because, and folks, there are elections every two years and every four years in the state of Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. And so we'll start on our last question for everyone, which is sort of a, a two-in-one, if you will. So Delegate Davis, we'll be starting with you. And our final question here tonight is both to ask you to wrap up in any way you would like to share anything you thought about tonight that you didn't have a chance to share, but also your vision of how the Lieutenant Governorship should interact and work with the disability community. And we would love to hear from you now. Sure, well, once again, thank you so much for putting this together. I really appreciate the opportunity to share you know, our thoughts and opinions and, and with the community and hear from the community as well. Um, you know, I think the, the first answer to the question of how should the Lieutenant Governor's office interact, um, I, I think there should be a partnership there. In, as the Lieutenant Governor, we cast votes on all tied uh, pieces of legislation in the Senate. So as it sits, it's 2119, um, which we've already seen just recently, uh, a tie vote that the Lieutenant Governor had to break the tie on. And so that's not uncommon that that can occur. The second thing though, is that the Lieutenant Governor does have influence and leverage. I'm not running just to repeat over and over again, 2000 times have all the senators voted. I'm looking to be able to push an agenda. And for me, that agenda is to allow all Virginians to reach their full potential. I want every student to have the chance at the best you know, first class education and make sure we have school choice in there. I wanna make sure that those with different challenges and disabilities have the resource to reach their full potential. I think that's the one obligation that we truly have, you know, to our fellow man is to make sure that we provide that environment to allow everyone to reach their full potential, which is why I've been so honored to work with this community in the past, whether it's to, you know, uh, work on the license plates to, to raise awareness in the future, whether it's to pass legislation that uh, made sure that insurance companies continue pr to provide support after 10 years of age for those on the spectrum. Um, whether it's to get rid of the stigma associated, you know, with those that were taking um, uh, vocational classes uh, so they could take things that they excel in. I think that's important of all of us. So what I would, you know, say going forward is, you know, I love solving problems. It is something that I truly enjoy doing. I, I, I'm that guy that my, my wife jokes and it's, it's probably part of my, you know, ADHD that, you know, I, I find an issue at, at seven o'clock at night and I forget, Next thing you know, I forgot to have dinner. I forgot to go to bed. And by four in the morning, you know, I've, I've become very knowledgeable on a subject because that's what drives me is to solve problems for others. And so that's what I want to do as Lieutenant Governor is just not preside over the Senate, which is the constitutional requirement, but to use that of an area for, of influence to make sure that every person has that opportunity to reach their full potential. Uh, and I think that's truly what Virginia needs to be. Uh, and that's what will get Virginia back on the right track. 
as we go forward in 2022 and for decades going forward. So thank you again, though, for having me, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to have you here. And Mr. Alawalia, we will bring you back here into the spotlight, and we would love for you to, to have a chance here to answer those same kind of pair of questions. Both um, let us know. Well, there we are. Uh, let me get you back on the spotlight there so we can see you clearly. And for you to let us know kind of your closing thoughts tonight, anything you didn't get a chance to share that you wanted to, but also kind of your vision for how the Lieutenant Governorship would interact with the disability community. Well, as I said, I ran because I saw things were not right. I'm very concerned in the direction the state of Virginia is going. My goal is to add to the party. Folks, when I came to this country, I had to work hard. There was no alternate but to find a way to achieve the American dream. I have the same embodiment, which inspires and excites every person to come to this great nation. But it's most importantly that you adopt this nation. You take, when you take the Pledge of Allegiance, it's one nation under God, indivisible. And that's so important for us to know that and, and work with those same values. And for the disability community, I, I want you to know that. I have a child, my own daughter, who has disability. I understand these things. But I also have her younger brother, her cousin brother, who has serious disability. So I understand these things firsthand. My goal is to work hard for you and find ways to be your candidate, your representative, your voice, to make sure that we have these impactful legislations. Because as we all know, the Senate is very thinly divided. But impactful conservative legislation, I want to be the best TOO for the governor who hope, hopefully is a Republican governor so that we can really make Virginia the number one state and most importantly help all our communities just not one community all our communities to succeed and thrive because that's what makes it a great place for us to live and 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 raise a family and and be safe and and, and happy my request to you is my goal is to be your candidate who will be a grassroots leader through various forums, through your forum, through the grassroots Republican leadership, other NGOs, other organizations, where you can reach me and suggest your solution. Because I believe government should be smaller. It should be a facilitator of your problems and your issues. We should not make it bureaucratic. We should not hire some person to have this task force to that task force, because people and, and you know who, if we really want to have a task force, let's have people with disabilities on, that, on those task force who feel that there is a way that resources go directly to them and to their families to, to translate that into solutions. If we want to do that, get those people to do it and hold them accountable because it doesn't take long to fix things. We saw a president who did things in four years and made America great again. My goal is to make Virginia great again. So I look forward to earning your support. And, and being the nominee and hopefully getting elected with all Virginians seeing what our message is about, is about solutions and making Virginia a great place to raise a family. Appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mr. Allen, I'm so glad. What timing is that, huh? I hope you had a chance to multitask there and finish your other speaking. And we'll turn things over to you for your kind of two-parter wrap up here. So both any thoughts that you didn't get a chance to share tonight, but your overall vision for how the lieutenant governorship will work with the disability community. Sure. Um, so uh, I think the first thing is to make a couple of promises. And uh, I, I'm always very aware of, of politicians who make promises. Um, but I think that you, you have to be honest and authentic. And you have to, if you want to lead, you have to be willing to put yourself out there. Um, so number one, um, I think the best way that we can interact and show our support is to have a staff with folks with disabilities. I think that's the best way that you lead. So you have my promise that if I have a staff of folks that people that you'll be included. Number two, aside from the constitutional responsibilities, um, the, the lieutenant governor also gets to sit on various state boards and commissions. And so there is a Virginia Disability Commission and you have my promise um, that if I'm elected, um, I'm gonna ask to sit on that board, lead that board and have those conversations. And then thirdly, I think um, I wanna promise you the same thing that I promised everyone else. There are 95 counties in Virginia. 
I'll visit all 95 of them and we'll have a town hall on disabilities and what we can do better for you. I think that's the best way to approach this. Um, so those are the promises that you have for me. My email is lance at lancerva.com. You can reach out and talk to me anytime and I uh, appreciate your support. I'll keep it short and sweet tonight. You guys are the focus and you have my promise. Thank you so much to all of our candidates tonight. And I'll turn things back over to Connor who wanted to give us a message before we move on to our closing poll. We'll give Connor and Sharon a minute there to get things pulled up. All right, there you go. take it away. There you go. Thank you for participating in our forum. Reach out to us if you want to talk forever about disabilities. I am on the board of disabilities. And thank you everyone for attending our Voice Matters. Connor, oh, no, thank you. Thank you so much for speaking up to us. And, and given an opportunity, I'd like to have uh, a cup of coffee or what is it, whatever is your favorite drink or uh, <laughs> food. I would love to do that. Yeah. Please give me the opportunity to do that. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. And I have to say the whole world would be doing better if they had and a also, hamburger with Connor. <laughs> okay, so as promised, I will bring up our closing poll now. And with thanks to Virginia Board for People with Disabilities for paying for the caption or an interpreter, they've asked us to put this poll up. So I would be so grateful if everyone could do it. And it's anonymous. So meaning we will we'll capture your answers, but not who submitted the answers. And the first two questions are about your satisfaction with today's poll. And then the next four questions are about your demographics. So where you live and who you are. And again, this helps us make sure that we're doing our job, make sure everyone can get an answer um, and be heard in events like this. Thank you all again for joining us. And we'll leave that poll up there. And as you're finished with the poll, feel free to bow out. Um, most of tonight's event was recorded and will be posted at the Arc of Northern Virginia's Facebook page and on the Arc of Northern Virginia's YouTube channel, and I'm sure our partners will be sharing it as well. The questions that were submitted in advance that we didn't have a chance to ask tonight, we will certainly share with our candidates after the fact. We so very much look forward to working with whoever is elected and making sure that the voices and priorities of the disability community are heard. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight and a tremendous thank you to Sharon and Connor for their work in putting this event together, which is no small feat. We know our candidates, as we saw, wrestled a lot of conflicting uh, needs and requirements to be here tonight. Their time is their greatest gift. And so we're so appreciative that they took this time to be with us and we welcome them all to put any other closing information they wanted to. And I thank them for putting information on their website or other contact information in the chat in case folks wanna follow up with them directly. As a reminder, when you opened this forum in Zoom, a tab opened in your browser that has the information for the next six candidate forums. And we would love to see all of your beautiful virtual faces at all of those other forums. And always you'll have a chance to submit questions in advance and to make your voice heard. Thank you all so much for Thank working you. with us tonight. And I'll give one more minute on the poll and I'll wrap things up. Thank you. Okay, so 30 more seconds on the poll. And if you put any message in the chat box now, more time, something like that, feel free to do it. So you just let me know that you would like some more time to complete it and I'm happy to leave it open. Okay, we'll go ahead. Oh, more time, okay. So we're gonna leave a little bit more time on that poll, but otherwise we're closing out for tonight. I'll go ahead and turn off my camera and wish everyone a safe, happy, and well April 13th and week ahead. We look forward to seeing you at future candidate forums.
Okay, I see we're all wrapped up with polling. Have a great night, everyone.